Please follow the link below to donate to the Onyx Tavern for as low as $1 a month. And remember to submit your fan art to onyxtavern at gmail.com. Greetings and konnichiwa, and welcome to the Onyx Tavern. I'm your host, Rick the Barkeep, bringing you episode 211 here at the Tavern, where tonight we're going to be talking about the end of an era. Yes, we're going to be talking about the end of the Neo-Saban era. Because, folks, this is it. 2018 is the last chance we're going to get for Saban doing anything related to Power Rangers. Because, as we've talked about uh, previously... Hasbro did buy the toy rights to Power Rangers, but as we found out a couple weeks ago, now they own all the rights to Power Rangers. So yes, Hasbro is going to be making Power Rangers, uh, making the Power Ranger toys, uh, possibly making movies, who knows what's going to go ahead and happen with it. But the Saban Brands era, the Nickelodeon era, the new Saban era, whatever you want to call it, I prefer Neo Saban era because it sounds cooler, (laughs) Um, it's coming to an end. And uh, Super Ninja Steel is going to be the last season. And by the time Beast Morphers takes over, Hasbro is going to be at the wheel of the franchise. Um, Now, here's the thing. I've pretty much said my piece on the acquisition of the toys with Hasbro. And really, I don't want to retread in anything that I've said before. Because there isn't much to say on how I feel about Hasbro taking over the Power Rangers franchise as a whole. Um, cautious optimism is the best way I can go ahead and describe it much in the same way with the toys, but this really is a franchise that does need some, uh, new life into it. It needs a breath of fresh air, new creative direction. And, and I think Hasbro can go ahead and do it. I mean, I mean, I don't know anything about them. Again, like I, like I said in the, the Hasbro video before, I don't know anything about Hasbro's production, what they do live action or, or, uh, animated or otherwise. I mean, the closest I know is in um, 2014, my senior year of college, I did go ahead and take a tour of uh, the Hub Network in LA back when the Hub was still a thing. I'm told the Hub is, is no longer around. And I had good impressions of it at the time. Apparently, they really had a passion for My Little Pony. Um, and I would just hope that whoever is running Hasbro will have a passion for Power Rangers to put it in the direction that it needs to go. Um, but that being said, th- there's not much else I really have to say that I can make a full video on. Uh, again, if you want to hear my thoughts about the toys, go check it out. You know, that, vi- that video is up. But now that 2018, we know definitely will be the end uh, of Saban's involvement. And yes, I know they're in pre-production right now of Beast Morphers, but I imagine they're going to keep a lot of the creative staff kind of in place um, as we transition into 2019. It's probably going to be the higher-ups, the brass, and all that. They're really going to be changing. But I am still going to count Beast Morphers as part of the Hasbro era because... Because, okay, let's not let's not do what they do with Wild Force and Ninja Storm and, and kind of break it down and all that. But just for the record, Wild Force is part of the Saban era. Ninja Storm is part of the Disney era. There, I've said it. Um, heck, maybe my opinion will change when Beast Morphers comes out. But right now, to me, the Neo Saban era includes Samurai, Mega Force, Donald Charge, and Ninja Steel. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Because I want to do like a retrospective on how I felt uh, about the Neo Saban era and, you know, kind of where I believe it left in the franchise and where I hope we, we, we go from here and the things that we've learned about the Neo Saban era. Because I'm going to be honest with you folks, um, Neo Saban did some good things, but it is way outweighed by a lot of the bad things uh, that they've done. And again, I just kind of want to go over the history of it how I feel, give you guys my thoughts, and just kind of see where it stacks up with the other Power Ranger eras. Because frankly, we are going into our fourth era of Power Rangers. Of course, we have the Saban era, the Disney era, the Neo Saban era, and again, the Hasbro era. And here's the thing. Now, when I first heard that Saban Brands was going to get the rights back to Power Rangers from Disney, uh, I was super excited at that time. Because here's the thing. When you look at the Saban era, which is everything from Mighty Morphin up to Wild Force, compared to Disney era, which is everything from Ninja Storm up to the revisioned Mighty Morphin, Saban era wins 
no question. Um, I know that's going to rub some people the, uh, the wrong way, you know, but hey, <laughs> why start now, right? But the Saban era as a whole, I always liked better than D Disney. And there are a number of reasons. Obviously, nostalgia uh, is going to play a big part of that. The characters, um, the stories, and, and just a lot of things they were doing in that era, I really enjoyed over what Disney was doing. And you guys know me. Um, I really think that the Disney era really started off bad for me. It got good with Operation Overdrive, which, yes, I am aware of its flaws, but I enjoyed it tremendously. Jungle Fury, I did not enjoy so much, simply because I had seen Geki Ranger around the same time. I was kind of watching him concurrently, so, you know, that uh, some people say apples and oranges, but I look at it as a good apple and an apple with a couple of bruises on it. And then, of course, RPM comes around, and that uh, that's like, oh, no, no, done, done, done. Disney, do something, you screwed up. And, of course, you know, the, the cherry on, on this cake was the, the revision because, yeah, because kids need to know that that red Tyrannosaurus Zord belongs to the Red Ranger. That's exactly what we need, and sparkles and comic book effects. That That's exactly what Power Rangers needed. Honestly, those last two years of Disney ownership were just horrendous. So, when Saban was announcing they were going to take it back, and they were bringing Zacker back, and they were bringing Judd Lynn, and, and all those guys who worked on it before, and, you know, it was like, it was, it was returning home, you know, it went out to college, discovered itself, made some horrible decisions, and couldn't pay for ramen or laundry anymore and had to come back and live with daddy. <laughs> That's kind of the way the Power Rangers franchise um, looked at looked for me. And I thought, okay, hey, this is going to be great. They're taking it back. And then, of course, they're going to do a Shinkane Drive adaptation. Because, of course, the, Disney didn't do that. Uh, they didn't decide to adapt Shinkane now, the prevailing theory is that they thought it would be too difficult to do it, you know, because of all the Japanese stuff in it, you know, whatever. Um, and, of course, in my mind, heck, you know, Samurai is going to take a chance. You know, Saban's going to take a chance on Samurai, adapt Shinkanger. We're going to have some Japanese culture. We're going to have some cool stuff added in there, things we had never seen in the Power Rangers franchise before. So I was really excited about it. Then Samurai aired, and I, I think all the problems of the Neo-Saban era can really be summarized within Samurai itself. Now, yes, Mega Force, Super Mega Force are a mess. Down Charge got better, and Ninja Steel, we'll get to Ninja Steel. Um, but here's the ultimate problem I had with, with, with Saban with the Samurai stuff. First of all, and this is something they did the entire time, and I don't really get why they decided to go ahead and do this, because it really just kind of boggles my mind on, on what's happening here, is that they do decide to split the show into 20-episode seasons over a two-year period and then rename it Super within that second year. And, and I don't really get this. Um, so supposedly the contract with Nickelodeon says they only do 20 episodes, they air for a year, and they do 20 episodes the next year. So they end up getting 40 episodes spanning over a two-year period. But what they do is they artificially make it two seasons. Because if you actually go out and buy the DVDs, you could buy Samurai and Super Samurai, Mega Force and Super Mega Force, and so forth on, on two different CD sets. It's not one season. It's artificially made into two seasons. When it, it in its core, it is one season altogether. Mega Force is a different animal, but again, we'll go ahead and get to that. But I just don't like the idea of the arbitrary split off into two year period because what that did, I think, for the the Saban era, excuse me, Neo Saban era, is it really makes it feel like it's longer than it is. That we spend two years with these Rangers, and then we're gone. Two more years, two more years, so forth. But when you condense it down. You know, Samurai is no longer than, you know, Lost Galaxy or Ninja Storm or any of those other seasons. It's about the same, give or take a few episodes, but it just feels longer and it just feels like it drags. But then when you actually sit down and watch the series, it goes by pretty quick because that's another thing. The pacing of these seasons are also very quick. So it's an interesting conundrum. When you actually watch the show, it's super quick. But then you, you put over two years, and it just feels like it goes on forever and ever. And it's reruns of the same episodes over and over again. It just, 
again, I, I just don't get what they were, were doing here. And of course, what they started to do in this, this portion was they wanted to bring back the nostalgia for the Mighty Morphin days. And I would say for the first three uh, seasons, that's what they really tried to do with the nostalgia. Samurai's trying to bring back, uh, you know, all, all the call signs, and they're trying to bring back Bulk and Skull. They got Bulk and Spy. They got the Mentor. They try to do everything they can to make it like Mighty Morphin. Mega Force goes into the same direction, but more so. Teenagers with attitude, Gosei and his uh, robot assistant, and, and all that. And of course, we get downcharge and go back to the dinosaur uh, nostalgia. So there are a lot of elements of nostalgia that the Neo Saban era is trying to ape on. And one of the things that did happen at the beginning of the Neo Saban era was the fact that they did want to go in a more aggressive media direction, having a bigger presence on Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms, YouTube and, and whatever it is. Um, and they really did do, do that, and they really aggressively pushed it. But where I would say they made a mistake is, what really gets me, is I'm really starting to have Mighty Morphin fatigue, if that's really a thing out there. Because what was great was that they got Power Rangers back into the public consciousness, that you would go into places like Hot Topic and Walmart, uh, you know, go to the video store, Best Buy, wherever, and you would start seeing Power Rangers stuff again. Because I don't remember seeing any Power Rangers stuff, you know, prior to 2011, when you go out, maybe there would be an odd T-shirt here, or there, and there'd be some young boys' uh, clothing, you know, for whatever the the current season is. But by and large, you would not see any Power Rangers merchandise at all unless you go to the toy aisle. But as soon as Saban took over the franchise again, we did get an explosion of merchandise all over the place. But it was only of the Mighty Morphin era, and at that, the first season. Sure, they threw Lords and the White Ranger in every now and then, but that was pretty much it. It was back to 1993 is what all the merchandise was. And what kind of throws me is like, if you're going to have an anniversary of Power Rangers, or if you're going to celebrate the Power Rangers franchise as a whole, particularly around the 20th anniversary, which was a big debacle, um, you'd want to represent all the Power Ranger seasons. Why were there only Mighty Morphin t-shirts? Where were the Lightspeed Rescue t-shirts? Or where were the Dino Thunder t-shirts? Uh, where were the RPM t-shirts? Where were any of those merchandises out there? Now, of course, people are going to argue the popular consciousness is aware more of the Mighty Morphin era than they are the other eras, which is fair enough. But I would argue this to you guys. Look at Star Trek, which had its 50th anniversary not too long ago. When you go out nowadays, do you see just Captain Kirk and Spock stuff? Do you see TOS merchandise only? No. You see Next Gen. You see DS9. You see the reboot films out there. Um, you don't see a lot of Enterprise and Voyager, admittedly, but you do see a lot of other franchise or other series within the franchise represented. Heck, you look at Star Wars. You still find prequel merchandise stuff out there for Darth Maul and Darth Plagueis and Anakin Skywalker. That stuff is out there too. Power Rangers at that particular point, and even up to now, only wants to focus on one portion of its history, ignoring everything between point one and point twenty at that time. Um, it wants to ignore all the other seasons. And again, as much as I hate RPM, people loved it, and you would think that there'd be more RPM merchandise based on fan uh, appraisal of it, because it wasn't just older fans enjoyed RPM, but a lot of younger kids enjoyed it too. So I did find it surprising we didn't get any type of, you know, RPM merchandise out there. Because, heck, I can go buy a Blue Ranger t-shirt right now from Mighty Morphin, but what if I want to go ahead and get, you know, Flynn's t-shirt from RPM? It's not out there. Nobody, nobody makes that shirt. Um, so, long story short, they spent too much on the Mighty Morphin nostalgia. Now let's talk about the context, the content of the series, because, and, and I know a lot of you guys don't always agree with my, my Sentai, uh, you know, way I view Sentai in comparison to Power Rangers and all that, but what really irked me about Samurai more than any other season is that in an age of internet, when you can look this stuff up, you should not be taking word-for-word -word translations of Japanese episodes and put them through Google Translate, 
and then presenting them on screen as new episodes, basically. All they that's all they did. They just took the scripts, translated it, took out anything Japanese. They took out anything that says Japan and replaced it with America slash New Zealand. Took out the word kanji, replaced it power symbol, and replaced Japanese uh, culture and history with nothing. Uh, that's pretty much what what they did in the series, and and that to me was a very very bad sign because at this point I had seen Shinkanger, I was aware of it, and I would argue that a number of fans were already aware of the series. So to go in with the way they did, and basically whitewashing the series, and I know that that's a, a hard term to go ahead and throw out, but that's basically what they did, and I think the the bigger insult there is also. There's only one Asian person within the Samurai crew, and that's the Pink Ranger, who gets no attention other than, oh, I want to be a bride and I can't cook very well, which is brought over from her Japanese counterpart, but lacks the cultural context, because Mia, wanting to be you know a good wife and, and is bad at cooking, that's play for comedy in America, but can also be viewed as anti-feminist, uh, you know, and, and just follow along with society. And there's a lot of negative connotation with that. Whereas her Japanese counterpart, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, Shinken Pink, that's perfectly fine within their society. There's no problem with it. So basically what, what you're taking is something that's culturally acceptable in Japan, translating it into Amer uh, to American culture, and it becomes problematic. And that's just one example of the numerous problems that they had with Samurai. Now, when they go in the Mega Force, they make it much worse. They abandon all contacts whatsoever and just copy paste and Frankenstein the whole season together. What you can see from the first two seasons of, of the Neo Saban era is that they were definitely rushing, that they really seemed to have no plan or idea of what they were trying to go ahead and do. Now, as we know, they did have some sort of plan, but it kept getting changed and, and things didn't work out. And there seems to be a clash between writers, creators, and some of the higher-ups. For what reason? I'm not particularly sure, but it seems like that there were two entities going, uh, going at it in the Neo Saban era, at least in the first half, where... Group A wanted this, but Group B was doing something else, and Group A and Group B didn't get along. I, I just I get that Samurai that they had a very short pre-production window. They had to get stuff in there. They had to get done, and probably the best way to do that was to translate the episodes all together. But you can't tell me that they couldn't have done better than, than what they did. I mean, ultimately, Samurai is kind of blah, and, you know, we kind of, you know hey, whatever, you know, they were in a rush, first season back, getting the kinks out, you know, hey, you, you got to give them that, you know, that that's kind of the way it is nowadays, and I'm kind of on that side, it's kind of forgivable. But after two years of doing this, and for them to go in and make Mega Force and Super Mega Force the way that they did, I mean, that's unexcusable, folks, because it goes from not enough time and trying to get everybody on the same page to sheer incompetence. I mean, because how else do you explain Megaforce? H how do you explain the anniversary season not being an anniversary, once again copy and pasting episodes which did not work for you in the in the first place, and abandoning all context uh, to, to make it even worse? Um, and again, like I said, the, the quickness and the compression, because it was, what, the second, third episode that they got brand new Zords from Gosei in, in that? I mean, it's just like jam-packing everything in there because I don't know why. I mean, yeah, you can go ahead and say it's to sell toys and all that, but do, do you really need to throw so much at us at once when there is no story, when there is no characters? I mean, tell me right here. What do you, what does everybody remember of the of Gia's character within Megaforce, other than her being hot and attracted to Jake? I mean, I can't honestly remember anything else about her. You know, she's so out of the Power Rangers consciousness because uh, they just try to jam everything in there. It's action scene after action scene, scene with no context, 
and episodes that are supposed to be a uh, reverence for the Power Rangers as a franchise, but exists within a world in which Power Rangers does not exist. I mean, actually, here's one of the interesting things is that when Zacker took over, he had made an offhanded comment that the Disney era was not canon within the Power Rangers universe because, well, I mean, originally Ninja Storm was supposed to not be canon because the writers didn't want to do it. They want to make it separate, make it its own thing. But of course, by the time Dino Thunder rolled around, Tommy was introduced, you know, whatever. But Zacker had made the comment that, you know, that the whole Disney era is non-canon and only Saban era is and Samurai is going to pick up years later within the same canon as Power Rangers. And to me, that kind of made sense at the time. You know, when I first heard it, it's like, okay, so you got two different timelines, your Earth 1, Earth 2, whatever you want to go ahead and do, multi-universes. And you got the, the Saban and you got the Disney and everybody's kind of happy. You know, whatever. Uh, of course, those comments were not true uh, at all. And of course, the Saban, Disney, all those eras are all combined it is one timeline. So that being said, keep in mind that Zacker, who was in charge of all this stuff, had said that Samurai was a continuation from the Saban era. And that Megaforce is going to be a anniversary season to all of the seasons. They ignore Power Rangers history constantly throughout that series. I mean, keep in mind that it is in the second, third episode in which Mr. Burley reveals that he's a cryptozoologist, and he talks about wanting to meet aliens. And the way in which that conversation goes indicates that aliens do not exist at this point or that they have not met them. Again, how do you write for a series that's 20 years old, whose main shtick is aliens from outer space coming to invade us, where in the very first season, the toys were marked as evil space aliens, but in the second episode of your 20th anniversary season, you say, oh, I hope that we will see aliens someday. I mean, I, I, I don't get how you do that. I, I just... It boggles the mind. I mean, especially when you have Space Rangers and Galaxy Rangers. And if you have Space Rangers, then you have to acknowledge Countdown to Destruction exists. I mean, it just does not mesh at all. And it's just a complete mess. And that's why, I, that's what, again, why I think that Megaforce was a simulation. You don't know what I'm talking about. Check out my previous video. Dino th Charge. I have mixed feelings about Dino Charge because on the one hand, it got very ambitious. They tried some new things, but it kind of petered out and it just kind of fell flat, uh, to be quite honest. Because they introduced some interesting characters throughout the series, but they always chose to tell stories of the characters who were not that interesting. Um, they always tried to go in certain directions that didn't make any particular sense. Um, and they just had a conclusion that threw all logic, reason, common sense, and believability out the window. And, you know, here's the thing about Dino Charge. Like, again, like, Coda is one of my favorite Dino Charge Rangers, definitely in the top five, and I do like stories about him. But they don't focus on him. He's the funny caveman. Let's not forget that he's, you know, a couple hundred thousand years, you know, out of touch with society. Uh, that his brother, who he cared for so much, has been dead and probably on ice in the British Museum. Um, but he's played for comedy instead of the genuine tragedy and pathos that something like that would imply. Same thing with Ivan. They did the same thing. Guy out of time, lost everything and everyone he knows, played for comedy. So they don't focus on characters that they want to, or I mean, th that would make sense. They want to focus on, hey, these guys are comedy, let's move on to, to other characters. They spent more time with Shelby, who is a great character, but I don't think that she really grew on me as some of the others. I thought Prince Philip was an awesome character, and, and hey, I'm going to tell you guys this right now. We need to get a hashtag movement or something going on where Xandar needs to be the next Wakanda. That we need to make basically um, Prince Philip the next King T'Challa, basically. Uh, that needs to be something because, hey, 
Marvel, DC, all those franchises have fictional countries with kings and rulers, Latveria and Doom, and you know uh, uh, Aquaman and Atlantis and uh, Diana and the Amazons. We have Xandar and we have the Gold Ranger. But uh, I mean, the, excuse me, the gold, the Stone of Xandar is the Gold Ranger, but we have the Graphite Ranger. Let's have a movie called Graphite Ranger, where it's Prince Philip is be, he becomes king, and you know he takes on the mantle of the Graphite Ranger, which is going to be passed down through generations. I mean, guys, it writes itself. I mean, come on. But yeah, hashtag Xandar is the new Wakanda, or, or whatever you guys want to go ahead and do. I would love to to see something like that gain traction, because hey, we have our own fictional country. Let's do something with it. Uh, but they don't focus on characters that, that I think are more interesting. Albert, I thought, was an amazing character. I thought he's somebody we could keep around and we can do some interesting stuff with. Because he's so not the mold of what we think a ranger should be. Um, and he's gone in one episode. Just just gone. Um, and I've, I've harped on this before and all that. But it just seemed to me Donald Charge lacked a lot of focus cobbled together an ending, focused on characters they need to, like, we didn't need Snide and Heckle, we, we didn't need those guys at all, I didn't think they added much to, to the show that we didn't already have, um, focused too much on the villains, and we had ten rangers, and we couldn't be bothered to explore the more interesting ones, uh, within that series, and so, you know, Dial Charge, you know, we, we had that issue, and let's get to Ninja Steel real quick, because, and I feel like the worst person in the world for this, or at least the worst Power Ranger fan. But I still have not gotten past first episode of Ninja Steel. But here's here's what I've kind of noticed, is that it, it reminds me a lot about Megaforce. That here we are in our, okay, what is this, 23, 24, 20, 24th and 25th seasons of Power Rangers. And we're still not using common freaking sense within this show. Um, again, I'm just watching the first episode, and we have a, I don't even know what our main villain is, he decides that the best way to get the Ninja Steel stars, whatever and stuff, out of the rock, is to host an intergalactic game show, gladiatorial show, that's a fight to the death, broadcast it, and use the winner to, uh, to try to get the stars for him. And he goes so far as he traveled to Earth and has his ship in Earth's orbit. And and just right there, folks. I mean, if you don't see the problem with that, I mean, I just don't know who's writing this show sometimes. Um, what material are they given for the show? I mean, you should have a novel at your disposal on the history of Power Rangers, the different alien races, the major events, the plot points, and things that happen. People keep getting on about that damn hoverboard in the first episode that the Pink Ranger is riding. But nobody talks about the damn spaceship that goes in the Earth's atmosphere and goes unchallenged. Because here's my thing, folks. Power Rangers history, given the technology that we've had, Terra Venture, Lightspeed Rescue, Zords with military organizations, all that stuff, I don't blink twice at a hoverboard. I'm going to be honest with you. That's, that is technology that Earth should have after Dark Fortress came, after the GSA, after Lightspeed Rescue, after Time Force went mucky in the past. That is technology that Earth should have. And yet people are harping on that, how nobody mentions it. But it's like, yeah, it should be there. Hover technology should be something they have. But the fact that the villain runs a, you know, death battle gladiatorial match in space and goes unchallenged for, what, 10, 15 years, something like that? Oh, nobody points that out at all. Nobody thinks that's, one, stupid, and two, that would go unchallenged by any number of Power Ranger teams or galactic forces. No, no. I mean, guys, this first episode of Ninja Steel already told me the series is broken. And from what I'm hearing from other fans... Yeah, Ninja Steel is, is is not that good. So, like the end of the Disney era, we're petering out on something that's pretty bad. And I will get to Ninja Steel. I will watch the whole thing eventually. But, oh my goodness. It's just like that first episode almost broke me. I was like, I, I can't do, deal with all the stupidity that we, we have in this. And somebody... And I'm going to say it because I don't have any other form to say it at the moment. 
There is a difference between prestidigitation and magic. Can somebody please explain that to the writers and what they were doing with the Blue Ranger? Be- because, I mean, there's being Houdini and there's being Harry Potter. There is a big gap between the two, and the writers don't seem to get that. But I digress. So what have we learned about the Neo-Saban era? Well, I, I'm just going to go out and, and say it. I think the Neo-Saban era, in general, is kind of a incompetence, lazy, half ass sort of thing. Because when I watch those shows, it's like, you got to do your job, you got to come to work, you got to make a product. I'm not seeing passion behind it. I'm not seeing interest in it. I'm not seeing the creativity. Now, as I've said, um, I didn't like the Disney uh, era that much at all, in comparison with the original Saban era. But if I had to give one thing to the Disney era that the Neo Saban doesn't, is that there was a little bit more creativity there, that there were some interesting things that they were doing with those characters, with those shows. Do I always agree with it? No, not at all. But, heck, I mean... They were trying different things. I mean, SPD, a series that takes place in the future, and aliens live on Earth? Okay, that's a risk. And that's something that, in the Neo-Saban era, would not have lasted past the first two episodes. That the whole alien thing would have been left out. Uh, RPM, the end of the world. Poor execution, but great premise. You know, hey, you're starting off well. Jungle Fury, secret uh, academy of kung fu students with an ancient evil in a box that they have to fight. It's a dragon. Okay, hey, great concept. They worked a couple of good angles in there, interesting characters. And that's more than I can say about any of the series. Samurai, if I had to sum that up... um, Google translation of Japanese material. It's basically like Weeaboos wrote the series without any real context of what Japan is. Megaforce, a complete train wreck. Uh, No fundamental understanding of what anniversary episodes are supposed to be or what Power Rangers are supposed to be, for that matter. Dino Charge, Oh, great idea, great start, but you couldn't uh, you know, make it to the finish. You had great characters, but you did nothing with them and tried to focus on characters that nobody gave a damn about. And Ninja Steel, like I said, it broke me after one episode, so I don't even know what the rest of the series holds, but it, it, it can't be that good. I mean, I just, I know I'm judging on the first episode, and it's my bad that I haven't watched the series, but man, just after one episode, I'm just like, oh, this is... This is horrible. This is terrible. I don't know what's going on here. Um, now, I'm not going to say good riddance. You know, I love Power Rangers. I want to love everything about Power Rangers. But here's the deal. It has to meet me halfway by being good. And I'm really hoping that moving forward Hasbro, that... I mean, I like to think that the creators... Um, and the people working behind the scenes, that they try to gauge the Power Rangers community. I guarantee they have at least one dummy account on Ranger Board. They look at the most popular YouTube videos. Heck, I hope some of them are listening to this show. Um, and I hope they realize the dissatisfaction people have had with the franchise, whether it be the toys, be the movies, um, be the, the actual content itself, and they want to go ahead and change it. I think taking Go Buster... Something that's a little bit more grounded, a little less fantastic than some of the other options, Tokyo, Ninja, and so forth, um, Zuoja, or whatever, or not Ninja, because <laughs> they've already done that, um, or Q Ranger. Something that's a little bit more grounded, something less fantastic, I think is going to be a good place for them to start. They already seem to be going off the premise of the original series, and hopefully that they'll go ahead and get some creative talent in there to to try new things. Um, that they just didn't have before. Um, but I'm ready to leave the Neo Saban era. I want to see greener pastures. I want to see better work out there. I think if history looks back on it um, at all, they're going to be like, you know, why did they even bother? Uh, why did Saban get this property back to create these four shows that, I mean, only one of them are any really good, you know, and again, that's half, half the season is good, and the other three are just kind of forgettable. Um, 
I mean, honestly, you stack this up with any of the Saban era original shows. I mean, Lightspeed Rescue is a lot better than Mega Force by any measure. Heck, I'd say Turbo is better than Samurai in most cases. Um, but that, of course, that comes after a reevaluation of Turbo. I mean, even at the Saban era at its lowest point, I think was a lot better than uh, you know Neo Saban at its best. But that that's just my opinion, of course. And you know, I'm really curious on what you guys um, think about the the Neo Saban era as a whole. I mean, again. I, I, I'm going to give you this quick kind of rundown. I think my favorite season is Dino Charge. Uh, my favorite Rangers. I mean, I like Mike from Samurai just because he was so different against the grain from, from the other Rangers. Mega Force, kind of a wash, really, with all those characters. Maybe Robo Knight would have been my favorite Ranger. Uh, Dino Charge. Coda was great. Prince Philip, uh, Albert, those guys. I, I love seeing them. I, I, I'd like to see more of them. Uh, Ninja Steel. I again one episode. I mean, who did I like in that first episode? The Yellow and White Rangers. They seemed interesting. Um, is that something I'm going to continue to like once the series goes on? And I actually watch it. <laughs> who knows? And heck, we still have a 25th anniversary episode coming up with uh, Super Ninja Steel, and we have no idea what's going on there. But I hope they try better than they did with Super Mega Force. But you know, if wishes were horses. Um, well, in any case, I mean, that's, that's, that's where we are and this is where we're going. The, the future I hope is bright. I hope Hasbro gets off to a good start. I, I, I just hope a few things that Hasbro does. First of all, don't split it into beast morphers and super beast morphers or beast super morphers, whatever and stuff. Just get all within one year. Um, I hope they do move the production back to the United States and out of New Zealand. Um, if you guys ever watch Lindsay Ellis, the Nostalgia Chick, watch her videos on The Hobbit and the whole New Zealand debacle, uh, because that is some messed up stuff, man. That is, wow, that's, go Google her stuff and, and take a look at what they were doing in New Zealand to The Hobbit, because I think we need to get out of there, because we are screwing those people, I bet, uh, with, with this. But But I digress. Anyway. That's what I think of Neo Saban. Let's leave in history. I, I hope when we look back, we look at it as, oh, growing pains before, you know, hey, Hasbro saved the franchise is, is kind of what I'm hoping. But let, let's see what happens. All right. Well, I want to thank you guys for listening. Have a good evening. And the tavern is now closed. <laughs>